I'm Nate Schwartz, and I have the privilege of serving as co-president of the MBA chapter of Net Impact. Net Impact represents all things mission-driven on the McDonough campus, so we were thrilled when we were asked to co-host this particular event as part of the Distinguished Leader series. Today, I have the honor of introducing Dean Thomas. One of my first visits to Georgetown's campus during the business school application process was for McDonough's focus on diversity. Dean Thomas came and spoke to us, which in and of itself really impressed me. I went to other events like it on other campuses and the deans normally didn't make it out. Dean Thomas posed a question that day that he said a McDonough student should regularly be asking his or herself. The question has stuck with me. He asked us, how will you impact business and society? How will your work make a difference to both the business world and the society in which we live? Now that I'm here at McDonough, I know firsthand that we indeed strive to answer that question every day, whether it's through the work of Net Impact, the Global Social Enterprise Initiative, the Georgetown Social Venture Lab, our involvement in Movember, the month of volunteerism, and the list goes on. With Dean Thomas as our champion, social impact is thriving here at McDonough. David A. Thomas is Dean and William R. Berkeley Chair of Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business, where he is committed to creating transformational educational experiences that prepare students to become principled and globally minded leaders poised to serve both business and society. Prior to his appointment at Georgetown University, Dr. Thomas was the H. Naylor Fitzhugh Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School, where he directed the school's organizational behavior unit, and an assistant professor of management at the Wharton School of Finance at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Thomas received a Bachelor of Arts in Administrative Sciences and Master and Doctor of Philosophy degrees in Organizational Behavior from Yale University. He also holds a Master of Arts in Organizational Psychology from Columbia University. He currently is a member of the Board of Directors of DTE Energy and the Estoril Conference's Advisory Board. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce to you Dean Thomas. Thank you, Nate, for that kind uh, introduction. Good evening and welcome to a special Distinguished Leader Series lecture at Georgetown McDonough. I'm pleased to announce that starting tonight, this forum for business leaders to share their experiences and expertise and interact with our students will now be known as the Stanton Distinguished Leaders Series. Daniel and Mary Stanton are proud Hoya parents. Their son Dan graduated from Georgetown McDonough in 2012 and their daughter Catherine will graduate this May. They also serve on the school's Parents Advisory Council. This lecture series is important to the Stantons for the same reason I hope it's important to you. Having access to business leaders like Seth Goldman who share insights and life's lessons has the potential to provide a transformational moment. We can all read about great business leaders, but hearing them share their stories in a setting like the one today and asking them our own questions is more impactful, memorable, and potentially transformative. I would now like to introduce our distinguished speaker, Seth Goldman, president and TEO of Honest Tea. Seth is someone who upholds the values we live here at Georgetown, principal leadership, global mindset, and service to business and society. As a successful entrepreneur, he also provides a wonderful example of how social entrepreneurship can have a, a double bottom line. Seth co-founded Honest Tea out of his home in 1998 with Barry Nailbuff. Today, Honest Tea is the nation's top selling organic bottled tea and is carried in more than 100,000 outlets. In March 2011, Honest Tea was acquired by the Coca-Cola Company helping to further the reach and impact of Honest Tea's mission. The company continues to deepen its relationship with Fair Trade USA, expanding its support of suppliers in India, China, and South Africa. 
Honesty has initiated creative marketing partnerships with TerraCycle, Arbor Day Foundation, and IndoSoul, and was ranked by the Huffington Post as one of the leading eight revolutionary socially responsible companies. Seth serves on the boards of American Beverage Association, Bethesda Green, Beyond Meat, Happy Baby, and, Rep and Repair the World, and sits on the advisory board of Net Impact. In 2011, Seth was appointed by Governor Martin O'Malley to the Maryland Economic Development Commission. Seth and Barry also are the authors of Mission in a Bottle, which was published early this year. Seth will be signing copies after his talk. Please join me in welcoming Seth Goldman. I understand um, not about eight of you made it to the Net, Net Impact Conference uh, earlier just last month. And um, so I want to spread the messages from Net Impact with you here today. Net Impact, for those of you who don't know, is a national organization, but it was started 21 years ago when I was in business school in 1993, the year they had the first conference. And I was telling Dean Thomas that the conference was here at Georgetown. Uh, there were about 100 people. Ben Cohen from Ben & Jerry's was the speaker. Ironically, I, um, although I was on the founding board of Net Impact, I couldn't make it to the conference. I had a family commitment. Um, so I missed that one, but I've been to everyone since then, all 20 of them. And it, the organization played a transformational role in the way I think about business and in my career. I got my first job uh, out of business school at the Calvert Group, just up the street in Bethesda. Uh, and then from there, when I launched Honest Tea, my, uh, one of my first interns was from Georgetown uh, through Net Impact. And um, then uh, Honest Tea, as we grew, we, we brought on board members, uh, Gary Hirschberg from Stonyfield Farm and Jeff Swartz from Timberland both of whom I met through Net Impact. So there's no question this organization, this movement, can play that kind of role in your uh, career and in your life. And it's a wonderful community. So I hope today I can share and uh, spread some of what I have uh, got out of uh, Net Impact with you here today. We're still early. It's still the fall. So you still are, um, even if you're in your second year, still thinking about what you're going to be doing with your career. And this is the right time to, to share those messages. For me, Net Impact really is a lot like family, and, and, and I'm skipping ahead a bit, but when we were starting to have our conversation with Coca-Cola about whether or not they would, wanted to invest in Honest Tea, and I was trying to give them a sense of how, would I, how could I share, show Coca-Cola what kind of community we're part of, uh, there were two things we did. Two things. Coca-Cola invited me to one event I'll tell you about, and then I said, well, look, if you want to understand where I'm from, why don't you come to the Net Impact Conference? That year it was in Vanderbilt. It was almost like, um, you know, you have a date you want them to meet your family. So I brought some people from Coca-Cola to the conference, and, and they really got excited about it, and they actually ended up sponsoring um, Net Impact going forward. The other uh, element, and it's, I can mention it because it's coincidental in the timing, when Coca-Cola was trying to help me appreciate all that they can do, uh, they had come to Bethesda to, to um, see our offices, which, were, which are quite modest uh, relative to what Coca-Cola looks like. But... Um, then they said, oh, hey, we hear you're a Red Sox fan. Would you like to come you know, watch a game at Fenway? This was in 2007. And so uh, the Red Sox were, as, as some of you may know, some of these are Red Sox fans, at least will know the Red Sox were on the, on the path to winning the World Series. I said, oh, that sounds great. I've got you know, three sons, but two of them are really into baseball. They'd love to come. And so we go up to Boston, and we're walking through Fenway Park. And for those of you who don't know, um, the seats in Fenway are nice, but underneath Fenway, it's, it's like you're walking through your grandmother's basement. It's like it's wet and, and uh, mildewy and dark. And anyway, we come out onto the field, and um, we keep walking until the seats, Coca-Cola's seats, are literally right on top of the Red Sox dugout. It's sort of the D of red and the S of Sox. And my sons are looking at me like, are we really supposed to be here? I'm like, yeah, no, it's OK. And so, so we sit there. The first inning, it's against the Indians. The Indians go down one, two, three, and Kevin Euclid, the first baseman, on his way into the dugout, tosses the ball to my son, who you know, has his glove, of course. And he's like, oh my gosh. And, and I said to myself, oh, this deal just got closed. You know? and, <laughs> and the guy from Coke said, yeah, we had to pay Kevin Euclid a lot of money to do that. <laughs> Uh, I don't think they paid it really, but uh, anyway. Um, so I'm skipping ahead. I actually want to. I want to take a step back. I'm going to share with you the story of Honest Tea, how we built the company, and how we think about our mission. Uh, because we call ourselves a mission-driven business, and I'll explain what that means to me and how how we how that um, becomes you know manifest. How we make it into something. First of all, um, given the fact that we're all in Washington D.C., I know it's been a very odd fall, right? We've had some peculiar incidents. The government doesn't seem to be behaving. There were some 
strange things happening on Capitol Hill. There was, though, one positive uplifting moment that happened. When President Obama signed the order making sure that the military was going to get paid during the furlough, they took a picture. And over here on the Resolute desk, <laughs> you can see the bottle of honest tea. Now, somebody told me, well, you know, you should just Photoshop in so the tea's facing out. We always tell, we were just taking a picture. I said, make sure your tea's facing out. Um, I said, well, it wouldn't be honest to Photoshop that picture in. But, <laughs> but actually, it's interesting because if you think about it, you don't often see presidents with brands, right? They're pretty um, de deliberately non you know, they don't want to be too closely associated with the brand. So this was, and I actually am friendly with the woman who runs OMB. And I said, hey, you know, did you see this picture? She said, I was in his office five minutes beforehand. But uh, anyway, it's kind of interesting. So, and my, as my wife pointed out, there's no coaster on the desk. But um. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to show you a video that is from a sourcing trip. This will give you a sense. Uh, I told you where I'm from. I grew up in Wellesley. Uh, the, the company's based in Bethesda, Maryland. But our product... Our main product we sell are tea leaves, our bottled tea. So where does the tea come from? And I want to share with you a video of a sourcing trip I took to India about 18 months ago to two very different communities. The first is really the leading fair trade tea garden in the world. Um, it's got a school that's world class. Uh, and you'll see how our fair trade, uh, the funds that we pay back to this community, help support that school. The other community grows a product called Tulsi. Has anyone heard of Tulsi? few people. So Tulsi is also known as holy basil. It is a basil leaf. And it grow, it's a ground, you know, ground plant. Uh, grow, it, it, it is, um, we've been using it in an herbal tea. Um, but as you'll see, this community has much more basic economic needs. They only have power uh, for three hours a day, and they don't always know when uh, the power comes on. And you'll see what happens when I visit. Um, and so the way that we find to invest in this community is very different. So if we could roll the video. At Honest Tea, we always like to stay connected to our ingredients and the communities that produce them. So earlier this year, I traveled to Tamil Nadu in India to visit the Korakunda Tea Garden, 6,400 feet above sea level. Here's the two leaves, one, two, and the bud. Her basket is much more full than mine. Once the tea leaves have been picked, they're weighed and then shipped off to the processing center. Two thirds of the land is still rainforest, which helps explain why there's so much biodiversity. The landscapes in Korakunda are amazing, but the most cherished asset in the community is the school that's supported by fair trade funds. In fact, the school is so impressive that families from surrounding communities try to get their children into the school, even if the parents don't work in the tea garden. We were warmly welcomed and even treated to a local version of the Hokey Pokey. Just for fun, I brought along Stomp Rockets, a toy my sons and I have always enjoyed, and we even managed to get one stuck on the roof. We also visited Bengaluru to learn more about the Tulsi plan. The first farm we visited was four acres owned by a farmer and his wife. The power only comes on for three hours a day in Bengaluru, and it just so happened that when we were there, the power came on. So when the water pump started, it was time to plant the Tulsi seedlings. It took a few tries to learn how to plant the seedlings the right way. Cows roam freely in India, so you have to watch your step. Tulsi is also known as holy basil, and the herb is used in Hindu ceremonies, as seen here with this Tulsi garland. During the visit, our supplier and I cut the ribbon on a new Tulsi drying facility. The farmers can sell freshly picked Tulsi for about 14 cents a kilo, not that much. When they sell it as garlands, they can sell it for 36 cents a kilo. But when they can sell Tulsi as a dried ingredient, they can sell it for $3.70 a kilo. The new drying shed allows the community to capture more than 20 times the value of freshly picked Tulsi. I also met with several dozen local farmers and explained why organics is important to American consumers and a great market for them. The opportunity to meet these farmers and learn more about the spiritual role Tulsi plays in their lives made me even more excited to share this wondrous plant with our consumers. Okay, as I said, I'm an, I come from an activist mindset. And if you had told me 16 years ago I'd be living in Bethesda, Maryland, I would be... Um, 
running an organization that's helping to eliminate billions of calories from the American diet, and I'd be helping to spread and promote organic agriculture and helping to spread and promote fair trade labor in the developing world, I'd say, wow, that's a great nonprofit or NGO. What, what's the name of it? Or what's the government entity agency I'm involved with? I would never have guessed that it would be a, a beverage company, let alone one that today is owned by the Coca-Cola company, or let alone one that delivered a 26 times return to its original investors. So, you know, at Honest Tea, it's funny. I, uh, <laughs> for the first 10 years, we really ran the business like a nonprofit. And unfortunately, that was literally the case, too. It, <laughs> it wasn't just our mindset. It was, we weren't making any money. Um, but we always had a mission about, could we change the American diet? Could we change the way people interact with uh, nature and with agriculture? And um, we really stayed true to that. And, that's, and, and so now it's exciting to feel like we're building something um, that is a national brand with, with, with more potential to grow. So let's go to the origins. Um, as you heard, I launched the company with my uh, professor. So you, <laughs> obviously, we should be paying attention in class here. You never know who, uh, who your next business partner might be. Um, this is a scene, by the way, from the book. And the book is a comic book. Um, and so you know, why do we make a comic book? Well, I was telling Dean Thomas, just like the world doesn't need another beverage, just a Me Too beverage, the bookshelves don't need a Me Too business book. There's been a lot of books written about entrepreneurs. There's been a lot of books written about green business. But how do we tell the story in a different way? How do we bring people in who may not think about themselves as entrepreneurs or may not think of themselves as activists? And how do we sort of help people appreciate it? And so um, the book has actually been on a bunch of different bestseller lists. It's reaching a new audience, which is exciting for us. But it did start in the classroom. We were doing a case study of the beverage industry, Coke versus Pepsi. And Barry said, there's so many beverages out there. Uh, there's literally, as we all know, there's, there's aisles of beverages. How could anything be missing? How could anything not be uh, you know, sort of captured? And I said, well, you know, there's lots of drinks with almost all the same ingredients, almost all the same um, sweetness profile, different packages, different colors. But those two things are really the same. Why, why, when I make tea at home, I don't put in five teaspoons of sugar for a cup of tea. Maybe I'll put in you know, half a teaspoon or one teaspoon. Why isn't there a drink like that? And Barry agreed and said, let's do something about it. And I was in my second year of business school, which as a lot of you will soon be reaching, will know that's not necessarily the best time to think about launching a business. So I, I came down to Bethesda. I got a job with Calvert. And two and a half years later, after I had um, gotten some experience and was getting a little entrepreneurial itch, I, said, I, I went for a run in, in New York, in Central Park. And after the run, I, went, I was thirsty. And I went to a beverage shelf, and I saw the same gap. So I said to Barry, I'm ready to do something about this now. And Barry had just come back from India. He'd been studying the tea industry, and he had a few great insights, one of which was the name Honest Tea. And for me, that kind of made it all come together. Um, and so I said, OK, we're going to leave my job at Calvert. We're going to launch Honest Tea. And we registered the, for the name two different ways. We, we registered it as Honest Tea, the two different words. But we also registered it as H-O-N-E-S-T-E-A. And that was interesting because we heard back from Nestea's trademark lawyer who said, wait, you're trying to market a product called Ho Nest Tea. Uh, we're, we're not comfortable with that. <laughs> I said, well, I guess I don't think I'm comfortable marketing a product called Ho Nest Tea either. <laughs> we'll withdraw that application. And we held on to the name Honest Tea, which they were OK with. So uh, we brewed five thermoses in my house. Uh, we got an empty Snapple bottle. We had an appointment at the Whole Foods office up in Rockville. We got an empty Snapple bottle that we pasted label, a label on. And I went to the buyer. and I did my sales pitch about how he's got all the sweet drinks and all the watery drinks, but nothing like honest tea. And the buyer got it. He said, well, we'll take 15,000 bottles. And <laughs> there was this awkward pause where <laughs> I guess we really have to make this. We, did, we had not made it in any scale besides my kitchen. And I'll, I'll share with you a little bit about how we figured out how to make it. But we were in business. And that first summer, all we did was sample in those Whole Foods stores. So we hired these two. Uh, one uh, net impact intern was from Maryland, and one was from Georgetown. And it was funny because um, this was 1998, so it was roughly around the time when President Clinton had, um, had some issues with interns. And uh, <laughs> so I had, I, I remember so vividly, her name was Beth Bracken. I said, you know, please come interview me. Uh, in, you know, let's do an interview. Um, you can come to my house, uh, and we're going to interview in the um, guest bedroom. <laughs> and she's like, <laughs> she walked, she's like, this is a real intern. This is real business, right? And, it really was just me and, and the thermoses at that point, so it was a little odd. But she, she, um, she did a great job. <laughs> so, all right, so, so we got into business. We started selling in those Whole Foods stores. And by the end of the summer, we became the best-selling tea 
in the 17 Whole Foods, in the Whole Foods stores here in the Mid-Atlantic. And that was our launch pad. That enabled us to get to other natural food stores. And what happened was we started growing. We got a great response from consumers. And there were consumers who, this was, a, this was an example. This was a voicemail we got from a woman in Michigan who said, I went to your website and I thought, oh my gosh, how responsible are you? That is just so everything. I wish you did everything. I wish you did my banking. I wish you were my neighbors. Thank you so much. This, this idea that there's a real passion. And the reason is because if you like sweet drinks, you got lots of choices, right? They still do today. But if you don't like sweet drinks, if you're looking like, for something like honest tea, it's your, it was the only choice. At that time, there was nothing else like it. And, and so um, we had consumers who were really loyal. And it wasn't like, if you wanted honest tea and you went into a store and honest tea wasn't on the shelf, it wasn't like, oh, I want a 17 calorie tea, there's not one, so I'll go buy 100 calorie tea. They would go to the grocery manager and say, where's my honest tea? And <laughs> people would say, how come you sent your mom to the store? I said, it wasn't my mother. It was you know, somebody I didn't know. Um, People were really loyal. And we had, you know, we have this guy in California who's got a real honest tea tattoo. I mean, they're customers for life. So we had a small core group of consumers who were really passionate about the product. And then our challenge was, okay, we're, we're, we're working in natural foods. How do we go beyond natural foods? How do we reach more people? And so we went to the um, typical beverage distributors. And we were um, <laughs> rejected in so many different ways. This was um, some of the ways. So, you know, they would say, it's not sweet enough, it's too expensive, it tastes like grass, it's not an energy drink, not flashy enough. The classic, we didn't put it here, but I went to a distributor in New England that we really needed, and he said, no, no, you know, I, I, I like what you're trying to do, or I, I see what you're trying to do, but we have, you know, we're, we're a big Snapple distributor, we make $5 a case with Snapple, we're only going to make $3.50 a case with your product, so, you know, if you can figure out how we can make $5, we'll do it. I said, no, all right, no, Snapple's in a 24-pack case, and we're in a 12-pack case. So actually, you're making $7 a case with it. No, 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 we got to make $5 a case. We just, you know, that's... <laughs> and so Barry said, well, can I flunk this guy? I said, you can flunk him, but it's not going to change his mind. It was a very um, interesting case of where, you know, business logic conflicted with business reality. Uh, so we were struggling. We weren't able to get distribution beyond the natural foods channel. And so we had to find a different way to build distribution. And we developed our own network. We called them the C distributors. And I, I wish that C, in this case, was the description of their quality. They were more like D minus. But um, they were called C because they, all of the names started, all their ways to describe them started with the letter C. So we went to the gourmet stores. We knew if it works well in natural, it should work well in gourmet. And so we went to the gourmet stores. And they said, well, you know, <laughs> initially it was, um, in addition to sampling, the interns and I were making deliveries. And I had a, I had a Saturn station wagon. I think. Um, Beth had a, had a uh, Honda Accord. It was, was very, very <laughs> primitive. And the, the gourmet store, you know, we're a high-end gourmet store. We don't really want someone unloading tea out of their Saturn station wagon in the front. It just doesn't look right. Why don't you try to talk to our cheese distributor? And so we got a cheese distributor who was, could bring the product around the back and do it the right way. <laughs> then I went to Bethesda Bagels, where, you know, for us, that's a great sampling venue. And we went there. He said, well, I don't work with a cheese distributor, but... You could talk to my Savile Foods, my corned beef distributor, and sure enough, we started working with a corned beef distributor who started going to the delis. And then we went to um, the supermarkets, independent supermarkets. They didn't work with either of these, and we ended up with the charcoal distributor. So it was just like, oh my God, whatever it was, we were getting some distribution. And so then the beverage distributors started paying attention because we were taking up shelf space, and the product was moving. So they said, well, all right. They started returning our phone calls because they knew we're going to get those sales with them or without them. And we started getting some beverage distributors. And um, it, was a, it was a good thing for the business, but it was a challenge because these folks are tough. Beverage, the beverage distribution world is a uh, very sharp-elbowed world. Literally, it's a fight for, real, for space every day. So, you know, if, if you go to a grocery store and you look at Raisin Bran, if Raisin Bran sells out, you know it's going to be in the same spot um, the next day. But in uh, a deli, that space isn't planogrammed. It's not planned the same way. So when Honest Tea sells out, um, you know, so the Sobe guy's going to come in or the Arizona guy's going to come in. And so these guys have some pretty tough, um, they're just, they're very aggressive people. And I, I was trying to think how to um, give you a feel for that. And so I actually thought the best way, I'm going to play for you a, briefly a voicemail from, <laughs> that one of our um, distributors left for one of our sales reps. And it's, it's a little um, coarse, so I apologize in advance, but it's for educational purposes. Just want to give you a feel for that dynamic. So if we could play the uh, voicemail here. Let's see if it comes up. Yo, Mike, this is Louie from Twisted Distributors. Look, 
All the things that you f up, if you handle that f***ing bitch that works for you, bro, you could take your f***ing honesty and you could stick it up there and cabin those f***ing big f You understand what I'm saying? They'll n I'm telling you, f*** you, f*** your honesty, and f*** that right, girl to the idea. So, I told that- point is that, <laughs> like, you can't, you just can't make that stuff up, right? And, and I think it's very easy in, in the ivory tower to idealize the virtuous supply chain, right? You start with the fair trade tea garden and the kids, you know, in the school. You go to the natural foods can store and the holistic consumer and everybody's singing kumbaya all the way. But the fact is, you got Louie in the middle. <laughs> and, and as you might guess, Louie is not motivated by the fair trade school. He doesn't really care about the natural foods consumer. He needs to know how is he going to make his $7 a case. And so it was an important uh, business lesson. We got to make this business work for everyone along the supply chain. It's not just the folks we think we're doing you know, good things for. And so we are doing good things for Louis. He's actually still one of our biggest distributors, if you can believe it. Um, but the point is you've got to make the business work and it has to, it has to be uh, competitive every, you know, at every point. No one's going to do charity uh, for you if you're going to try to create you know, a, a, a brand at scale. All right, so we started getting some beverage distributors. And then what happened was we were really um, getting enough interest from major chains that we were running into a different barrier. We would get approached by Safeway. Say, we see you're the best selling tea in natural foods. We'd like to see your product in all of our stores. And I said, well, we've got the coverage. We have beverage distributors in the, on the West Coast. We have beverage distributors in the Mid-Atlantic. And they said, well, you know, we own stores in Chicago. We own stores in Texas. When you can get us that full network, let us know and we'll take your product. We're like, wow. So either the choice is do we grow, do we grow to scale, or do we stay in a niche? And we knew we wanted to take this to scale. So we had been approached over the years by lots of different food and beverage companies who thought we had something that was scalable. Um, but in 2007, we were approached by the Coca-Cola company. And um, this was the presentation that they gave to their board and they shared with us when they talked about why they wanted to invest in honesty. So there are some big mega trends out there, not just fads, but really directions society are headed, society's headed. So health and wellness, environmental consciousness, and corporate social responsibility, these are all directions. And if that, that little white triangle, that area where they all overlap, that's a, that's a special space. That's a space where a company is making decisions, trying to harmonize all those priorities at the same time. And while it may be small in 2007, if you look five years out, of course, six years out, the standard for doing business will be that every company is expected to operate with that mindset. Their belief was that Honest Tea is a company that's doing that, and that's what we want to invest in. Now, we're talking, of course, about beverages, but if you want to think about where business opportunities are, and maybe during the question and answer we can have a discussion, that's where business opportunities are as well. Not just from an investment perspective, but from an entrepreneurial perspective, too. And so um, Coke had just created a group called Venturing and Emerging Brands. It's a unit designed to invest in companies, not necessarily to just take them over. And for us, that was perfect because we weren't ready to turn over the, you know, hand the keys to somebody else and let them drive this, this thing that we'd been creating. So they invested in 2008. They bought 40% of the company. And we kept running it out of Bethesda with the same management team. And when Coke had the option to buy the company in 2011, they, chose, they took the option. But it was working so well, we said, let's keep going. Let's keep the same leadership in place, the same team, the same arrangement. And so uh, this year, you know, it, it, we're still doing it and still growing. So what I want to share with you now is, okay, how do we take that partnership and how do we scale it while keeping it honest? And so first question is, um, <laughs> it raises some questions, right? You got a small mission-driven company operating in a large multinational. Well, obviously that's going to make some gray, right? It's not just a book people read on airplanes. Uh, so when I was growing up, I grew up in um, the 1970s. My parents were both professors, in fact. Uh, my father was a specialist in Russia. My mom was a specialist in China. So the Cold War was all around me. And at that time, we always felt like it was pretty clear who the good guys and the bad guys were. You had the capitalists and you had the communists. All right, we know who's good and who's bad. But today, it's a lot more nuanced. You know, today you'll have made in the U.S. or uh, when I was growing up, made in the U.S.A. was like the good thing versus made in Japan was sort of the mark of poor quality. But if you look today, You've got a car made in the USA by a Japanese company with parts assembled in Mexico. Well, I think I'm being patriotic when I buy that. You go and locally grown organic. Everybody sort of says that's the, the best kind of agriculture to support versus the factory farm. But when you go to Whole Foods, you'll be able to find organic asparagus that's been airshipped in from Chile. All right, well, it's organic, 
But if we flew over here on an airplane, that can't be a good carbon footprint. So there's a lot more gray. There's a lot more left up to the consumer to think about. You think about sustain. We're a company committed to sustainability, and the definition of sustain is to nourish and uphold. But how do we describe our economy? The consumer economy, right? The definition of consume is to devour and destroy. So automatically, we're in a contradiction. And the fact is, every company operates in that contradiction. And from my perspective, the only, um, there is no such thing as a socially responsible company. It's really just a direction you're trying to move. And can you be honest about that direction? Can you be honest about the, the flaws you have? We just put out our mission report. I have a copy here. I'll uh, <coughs> leave it for people afterwards. And actually, it is, it's also available online. And you know, we very, I'm, the, I'm proud of the fact that it's not a cheerleading document. It's, it's kind of like, it's really a chance to air our dirty laundry. I, I joke, so it's, um, I was with Barry a few weeks ago, my co-founder Barry, and, and he was wearing a business suit, but he had these crazy, you know, very conservative business suit, but these very brightly colored socks. And someone said to Barry, Barry, what's with the socks? He says, well, I said, I figure people are gonna make fun of me. I'd rather have them focus on my ankles. And so <laughs> uh, this is, uh, not that we're trying to have people make fun of us, but let's, let's be preemptive. Let's tell everybody all the bad things we're doing as a company. Let's be honest about it. We, we are doing some good things. I'll share those with you. But look, we're, we're a company that sells single-serve packages. Uh, national recycling rates are around 35%. So two-thirds of what we sell ends up in landfill. And we make, you know, I'm glad of the fact, I'm proud of the fact we sold over 200 million packages. But unfortunately, that means that over 130,000 of them are in landfill. That's not a good thing. So how do we reconcile that? And there really is no one antidote, but um, for us, it's, it's, it is um, being open and transparent as we can be, being honest about it, using, uh, rather than taking our word for it being organic, using the federal seal, the USDA organic seal, rather than taking our word that it's fair trade certified, using a third party certifier to, 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 to uh, enforce that. And those are some of the steps. All right, so what is it meant to be partners with Coca-Cola? Well, the big one, as you heard from Dean Thomas, instead of being in 15,000 stores, which is where we were when Coke invested, we're now in 100,000. So we reach a lot more people. And I mentioned the restaurant we just landed, we're in conversations with several other national restaurant chains. And for me, there's been a lot of these pinch me moments, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm talking to a, you know, a fast food chain that sell, has thousands of stores, and they might be selling organic, fair trade, low sugar products to their customers. It's an amazing opportunity. And then what about uh, production? How do we scale production? Because if we are reaching all those people, we need to make more tea. <laughs> uh, I'll, so I told you when I sold it to Whole Foods, I didn't know exactly how we were going to make it. And Barry's idea was, well, well, how hard can it be? You know, you have a tea bag, you, you dip that in water, just multiply times 10,000. <laughs> well, we did try that. Um, so we had these large bags that we would dip in, in water and it, the pipes would break and we end up with like an inch and a half of sediment in the tea. This is a picture from these are the bags over here, the boiling tank. On a good day, we'd make about 18,000 bottles, inch and a half of tea uh, leaves on the bottom. And people say, well, am I supposed to chew the tea leaves? I'm like, oh, no, that's not. <laughs> um, so that wasn't scalable. We moved over to this uh, technology. This was basically a large tea steeper, tea basket. We'd roll that and um, get about 60,000 bottles a day and with about a half inch of sediment. So that was better. But here we are partnering with it, you know, um, a, a distributor that can reach 100,000 stores. So at, some people said, well, Coke's going to look for shortcuts. They're going to try to make, um, they'll try to do it with, you know, powders or syrups or concentrates, trying to find a way to do it more cheaply. But instead, we set up these two uh, multi-million dollar tea brewing systems. This is our, uh, I'm up there on the third floor, the tea brewing system in Northampton, Massachusetts. This one's over in California. Each of these can make 500,000 bottles a day. Um, the, the, the clarity is much better, the consistency is much better, and there's, there's, there's a little bit of sediment, but it's not a, nothing you can chew. <laughs> so um, for us, that's how we took the production to scale. All right, so we got distribution, production, and then the challenges. How do we make, um, how do we keep innovating? How do we keep making the product fresh and what we call our mission-driven innovation? So one of the best innovations came, literally came out of uh, my house where I was, I'm, I make the uh, school lunch for my, for my, for my boys, which basically just means putting stuff in a lunch bag. And one day my middle son said, hey dad, I know you sell healthy drinks to grown-ups, but how come you put really sugary drinks in my lunchbox? And I looked and, and um, how many of you grew up drinking Capri Sun with your lunchbox, right? A lot of us, not me, but a lot of you. Uh, so I'm not the only one. You, you, um, but yeah, there's more calories per ounce 
and 100, if a juice pouch has 100 calories, there's more calories per ounce in that than a can of soda. And um, so, wait a minute, why couldn't we take the same equities of honest, that on, you know, lower sugar, organic, and put that in a drink pouch? And it also was an important realization for us. We, we are starting to understand that we used to think tea was the most important part of our name, honest tea. We realized the bigger, much bigger idea is honest. And so we took the product, basically we were selling a, a, a juice drink called Honest Aid. We said, let's just put that in a pouch, Honest Kids. And it's exploded. It's been over 30, uh, it's now over 30% of our business, and it, this year it's growing at over 44%. So it's growing faster than all the rest of our business. Um, and as it was growing, uh, we said, well, how could we, what could we do better? What could we do more? So when we launched it, it was sweetened with organic cane sugar. And we said, well, you know what? Some parents don't like to see sugar as the first ingredient. So this year, we took out all the sugar and we sweetened it only with organic white grape juice. <clears throat> Nutritionally, it's the same. Same calories. 40 calories is 40 calories. But think about who the shopper is. A, shop, a parent, in this case, picks up a box and says, oh, organic white grape juice. That's not a bad ingredient. Versus so a lot of them might say, well, sugar, that's, you know, I can get that elsewhere. So um, in order to do that, we, had to, we ended up buying more than half the world's supply of organic OU kosher white grape juice. We had to fly rabbis to Turkey and to, and, and to Argentina in order to, to lock in the supply. But that's a great example of something we were able to do with Coca-Cola's um, support and capabilities. All right, so the innovation, as you'll see, uh, we also launched larger bottles. We have a new line called Honest Fizz, zero calorie, naturally sweetened soda line. And then this is the fresh brew. This is what we're selling in the restaurants. So you can see as we look at our growth, it's been highlighted by innovation all along from, you know, from first organic bottle tea, first fair trade bottle tea, lightweight packaging technology. We're always thinking about how can we take it a step further. And when we do, when we do it well, and we don't always do it well, but when we do it well, it leads to more growth and more leadership. Of course, as I said, we don't always do it well. And we had our share of failures. We had a tea bag line that failed. We had a line called Honest Coca Nova. Anyone taste that one? That's why that one failed, yeah. So we, <laughs> we just, you know, we have to be willing to fail too. It's part of the process, and as long as we can learn, from our failures, we'll keep going. And yeah, this year we'll do over $110 million in sales, so more growth ahead. Okay, so now we got distribution, innovation, production. What about the marketing? How do we get this product available to more people? And, and this was, um, actually that's, that's supposed to be our, our Georgetown MBA intern there giving out samples. <laughs> in the first summer, that was our marketing. Just give people product. And we gave out more product than we sold, but we reached, uh, we still became a, you know, the best selling tea by the end of the summer in those whole food stores. So how do we then take that to scale? How do we reach more people? Because no, um, in the beginning, in 17 stores, we could literally talk to most of the customers who were buying the product. You get to 15,000 stores, you can get to a lot, most of the large stores, but you get to 100,000, you don't have that ability to interface with people in the same way. So how do we create and extend authentic marketing? And so we, um, I'm gonna share with you an, uh, a campaign that we've launched for the past uh, five years called the uh, National Honesty Index. We set up these racks of bottled tea. We put up a sign that says it's a dollar bottle in the honor system. And then we just step back. No uniform personnel, no visible cameras. We just want to see how honest people are. I'll show you in a second what happened, but any guesses? How, how many people, what percentage of people do you think paid money into the box? 97, very optimistic. <laughs> Anyone else? Any other guesses? 90%. 90%. All right. I'm going to show you what happened, but in addition to paying attention to the video, think about this as a marketing campaign. Think about this if you were trying to spend, you know, as a media campaign and reach people. Uh, we'll show you what happened. Just how honest are you in public if no one has their eyes on you, or at least you think they don't? America's honesty has been put to the test using data gathered from experiments conducted in all 50 states. The company behind Honest Tea set up an unmanned kiosk all across the states. Those kiosks offer drinks for a dollar on the honor system. All while secretly recording. Did you pay a dollar or are you a liar? A social experiment is actually underway. Our company seeks to have this honest and direct relationship with our natural ingredients. And so we always wanted to test how much does the um, American consumer embody those same values. Did you get a tea? No, I didn't. I don't have any cash. And I feel guilty not taking one. <laughs> In some situations, you know, we actually had some people who tried to walk away with a rack of tea just to see what, you know, if anyone would call them out and, wow. and no one did. And in yes. some states, 
Your experiment really paid off. Alabama, Hawaii, 100% of the people paid. Isn't that impressive? We track observable characteristics such as male, female, if you have a hat on. Someone put a $5 bill in and all they took was one drink, so they said they were extra honest. There's some beauty of the honor system when it works, it really is. The District of Columbia, they were the lowest. So those politicians in Washington, only 80% of them were yeah. honest. To add insult to injury, our office is based uh, very nearby, so I actually mm. um, took the metro in, and, and when I got back to the metro, my bike had been stolen, so. Oh. <laughs> And you paid. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 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 Someone else took the tea and then sent you a letter with money inside later <laughs> apologizing. Yeah. So obviously yeah. there's remorse out there. Based on the numbers from last year, uh, it was really honest. It was mostly between 90 and 100 percent honest. And it kind of makes you feel good about society and, you know, the way we're headed. So you think about that, what would it take to get your, our brand on the Anchorage, Alaska Evening News? But um, this we've been doing, and we've been doing it for five years, so actually, and the results are almost always the same. So it's really not news, but it's the kind of story that, uh, as long as you sort of put a little bit of a different twist on it this year, we did all 50 states, and that was our twist, and got gr amazing coverage, great brand visibility, and it's an authentic story, right? It's not like we're, we didn't make up anything, it's, we just went out and let people sort of do what they do. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun. We actually have done it on campus. I don't know if we've done it in Georgetown, but some, some campuses will come in at 104% because they'll want to show that they're extra honest. Um, so it's a, a fun way to build a brand. All right, let me, I want to give you some um, closing thoughts and then let's open up for discussion. So um, what, is it, what does it all mean? What are we all, what's the impact of what we're doing? Well, first of all, when Coke invested uh, in 2008, just before then, we had bought about 800,000 pounds of organic ingredients. This year, we'll buy over 5 million pounds. So now we're starting to change the way decision makers in, in our supplier communities think about, should we be organic or not? Should we think about fair trade or not? Well, there's clearly growth going on here. And so this is a good business opportunity for them. Uh, and then what does it mean in terms of how do we spread this story? How do we get others to think about this. Well, certainly for me, my presence here and net being, you know, supporting Net Impact and writing this book is a great way to bring people in and think about business differently. Um, as you probably can tell by the way I've been talking, I think business does need to change. And this uh, mission-driven path can be a very exciting way for business people, but for people who may not have come to business school thinking they wanted to be business people. I was one of those people. I came in as a, from a nonprofit background. I thought I wanted to go back into work for national service, and I, I still, I feel I still do work in national services, just in the private sector. Um, I've also found, as you heard from the dean, I've been, uh, I launched, a, a co-founded an organization called Bethesda Green. It's a nonprofit based in Bethesda. The first thing we did was put in recycling bins in downtown Bethesda, but then as we were growing, um, we got one of the local banks to support, um, give us office space. I said, well, that's great for our executive director. We have one employee. But what if we use it as a green business incubator? And we now have 16 entrepreneurs who have launched, or who are launching their green businesses out of uh, Bethesda Green. And then I've been on the board of Happy Family. That's an organic baby food company. By the way, a company, I met both of the CEOs through, uh, the, uh, the co-CEOs through Net Impact, joined their board, and just this year, Happy Baby sold to Dannon. And then I've just joined the board of Beyond Meat which is a really exciting vegetarian protein alternative. And I was with that CEO. He was at the Net Impact Conference last, uh, just uh, last month as well. So um, these are some of the things, these are some of the ways to think about how you can do more than just your own business. But I want to give you two closing thoughts, and then let's open up for discussion. So two Chinese proverbs. First says, if we don't change the direction we are headed, we will end up where we are going. It's obvious, true, right? <laughs> but where are we going? Well, uh, the United Nations recently ranked the average life expectancy of all the nations in the world. There's about 200 countries. And um, before I tell you where the United States is ranked, keep in mind we're the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. 
We have more advanced knowledge of science and medicine than any civilization has ever had. But we're not number one, and we're not number two. We're number 40. So what does that say about our diets, about our lifestyles, about our relationships with the natural world, about our relationships with each other? It means we're in a, a very bad direction, the wrong direction, an unsustainable direction. And as you probably can tell from my comments, I don't think the federal government is going to make, change the direction. I frankly don't even think big business is going to take us in a different direction. I think it's entrepreneurs who can find different approaches to diet, to life, to sustainability, to the way we travel, move, and, and, and coexist. And when those entrepreneurs can demonstrate that those ideas work in the marketplace, when consumers vote with their dollars and support those ideas, then the big companies will follow. But it can be extremely powerful and extremely inspiring. It can also be extremely challenging, too. And I certainly don't want to make this sound like this has been a cakewalk. I, one of my favorite um, scenes in the book is just after we made that first delivery to Whole Foods, I was at a family picnic. I was having a piece of pizza, and I um, felt something crunchy in my mouth. I said, oh, there's not supposed to be anything crunchy in, uh, in, in pizza. And it was my tooth that had cracked. And so I went to the dentist, and she said, oh, yeah, no, you're, you're grinding your teeth at night. Are you under any stress? Yeah, I guess you could say that. <laughs> well, you got two options. You can try deep breathing and yoga before you go to bed, or, or I can just fit you for a night guard, and your, your teeth will still grind, but there'll be that padding. I said, give me the night guard, because uh, I don't see myself relaxing anytime soon. So I still wear a night guard, uh, but it's important. I feel it's important work, um, and it is possible to do it. The, the, you know, um, from the start, when I was, said I wanted to leave a good job in a mutual fund company to go launch a beverage business and an industry I had no experience in, um, there were a lot of people who said, you just you can't do that. <laughs> and uh, when we decided to sell to Coca-Cola, and I said, yeah, but I, I know we're selling, but I still want to run the business. I still want to take this mission to scale. And then people said, well, that's just not how it's done. So there's always people who are going to say it, it can't be done. And I'll, I'll, in closing, share with you this Chinese proverb. This is on the wall of Honesty's office in Bethesda. Those who say it cannot be done should not interrupt the people doing it. So, <laughs> There are really exciting opportunities out there for you professionally, for our economy, for our society. Um, but they're not easy. The easy paths are out there. You know where they are. Um, I hope, I hope you, you, at some point in your career, you get the chance to do something you really believe in. Not just like, oh, I feel good about it, like passionate about it. The kind of thing that wakes you up at 3 in the morning. You can't sleep because you're so excited about what you can do through your work to make a difference. Thank you very much. Um, happy to open it up for questions, comments, suggestions, ideas, challenges. Um, I, think, I think about it a different way. We've had, to, we've had to pass up mission sometimes in order to stay in business. So, for example, in 2003, we brought out the first fair trade bottled tea. Uh, and we looked at, could we make everything fair trade? And what we realized is that if we had, first of all, there wasn't enough supply, so the price was high. And if we, had di if we did it, we would either have to raise our prices or collapse our margins um, or compromise our quality standards to get enough tea. And we said, and, and it was interesting because one of the people at the time in our, our marketing said, well, we've got to do the right thing. I said, well, what's the right thing here? Because just because we, want, you know, we, we all want to go to fair trade, but if we, if, we, if we do it right now in 2003, we could go out of business. That's not going to be the best thing for these gardens or for us. Um, and so we took a much slower path. It wasn't until 2011, after Coke bought the company, that we were able to make everything fair trade. So... Um, I won't let the business go out of business. That's for me, uh, I just, that, you know, so it's interesting. I'm not necessarily a believer in the double bottom line. Like, it's got to be a business. It's got to work. And I, as long as the business works, all those other things are possible. So, um, you know, by definition, our margins are less. We spend more on our ingredients. We pay more for our ingredients. We do. There's no, there's no way around it. I mean, as I said, we... <laughs> After Coke bought the company, we went to Fairtrade. Of course, Fairtrade's more expensive. You have a certification fee. 
and you have the fact that you're paying money back to these communities. So every time we buy tea leaves, we're spending more than uh, our competitors. Then our challenge is how do we make that uh, relevant to the consumer? How do we get the return on that investment? How do we convince people that that is something they should be paying more for? And that's our, that's our challenge. That's our marketing challenge. Yeah, I think you've got to be a, you know, people have memories, right? They'll know, they'll sort of know you when you were, they'll, they'll think, they'll remember you when you were during the good times and during the bad times. They'll remember how you act. And so, I mean, I kind of compare, it's not exactly, but we had this situation back in 2003. It was, it was a turbulent year for us. We had a broken glass in a bottle. And uh, it was in a Whole Foods store. And uh, that was really scary because... No, no one, fortunately, no one got hurt, but it's like, oh, that's, that's obviously not supposed to be in there. Someone could have gotten hurt, and Whole Foods has a three strikes and you're out policy. Then we found a second bottle um, that had broken glass in it. And so we said, we got to pull all the product. We don't know exactly why it's happening, how it's happening. We're going to pull everything. Um, another company didn't, had the same situation, didn't pull. Um, and it was an early test, and fortunately we weren't selling so much that it wasn't as painful as it could have been if it was a national withdrawal. Um, but it, it let Whole Foods know the kind of people we were. And we were, you know, we were going to go beyond what was required to make sure we could sort of say this is, this is how we're going to act well, in good times and in bad times. So uh, I, I don't think you can change your, I don't think you can be opportunistic. I don't think you can change your behavior uh, in one scenario and then act differently in another scenario because people will... Well, no, and it, actually, I'm really, I have to say, this whole experience has helped me appreciate consumers are, are, are they see through a lot. And so they'll see if you're gaming them or, or acting, and it, they'll remember. Uh, they won't, may not say it, they may not be able to verbalize it, but we hear in market research people, the, the, the way people describe personalities of companies, and it is like, oh, yeah, that's what they do. <laughs> that's what they do. So, so um, I don't know if I answered the question directly, but to me, you've got to be um, consistent uh, and, and uh, it, it'll, your, your personality will come through one way or the other. Even, even just, it's very hard to spin in the corporate world. I mean, you can, your company can say something, but consumers will see how you act. Uh, thank you for coming here. Does Honesty plan to expand internationally? Because I guess the reasoning you use here, like you have nothing between like water and right. sugar or sodas, like that, I can definitely see across other countries. Yeah. So tea is the world's second most popular beverage. Second only to water, thank you, it's not Coca-Cola. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so there's a great opportunity to take the brand internationally. Right now, we've, we've got to make it work in the United States. And I know when I say we're at, 100, we're at about 110 million in sales this year, but which is like almost 200 million in retail sales, but that's still small um, in terms of where we need to get to. We really want to become a billion dollar brand. So we need to scale. Uh, when that happens, then we can think about international opportunities. And, and it's not just tea, you know, Honest Kids has already, we're getting a lot of interest. We sell about a million dollars of Honest Kids in Korea. I mean, so we do some stuff, but not, not with investment. I mean, you can only really make money uh, selling beverages overseas when you produce them there. You can't ship liquid overseas and make money. So um, when we go to an international market in the real way, we'll invest the right way, set up production, and that, that's it. We're not there yet. We gotta still, still build it here. <laughs> Yeah, um, absolutely, and, and I'll, I'll go back to Honest Kids as an example. So I told you how uh, there was a brand that was 100 calories per pouch. In fact, most of the brands were 100 calories per pouch uh, for kids' drink pouch. You go to a shelf now, um, the biggest brand is at 70 calories per pouch. So they sell billions of those things, and if we played a small role in helping move that company toward a, a healthier product, then we can indirectly claim credit for removing billions of calories from the American diet. Um, that same, going back to pouches again, so Honest Kids, the drink pouches are not recyclable. 
So we felt, it's, even though the pouch is very efficient, it's very lightweight, we would prefer not to put something out there that's not recyclable without some solution. So we partnered with TerraCycle, a company that, so that kids could collect the pouches and send them in. And we were friendly with TerraCycle. We had this thing up and running. We had about a few thousand units around the country where these kids would collect, called br brigades, collect the pouch brigades. And then the head of TerraCycle called me one day. He says, hey, I just got a call from Kraft. They're interested in joining these brigades. Are you okay with that? Because, you, know, you know, you, you created it. I don't want to. I said, absolutely. We got to take this to scale. So um, now Capri Sun is part of the, the, the pouch brigades. Um, and over, in the past years, over 100 million kids' drink pouches have been taken out of the waste stream and recaptured because of those brigades. So we do see that. Bottled tea, the same thing. When we started, most bottled teas were at 100 calories. Now the market is closer to 70. Um, we're still, you know, the lower calorie provider, but um, we, wel we welcome that. I mean, that was what we got in business to do. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I, uh, I think I always felt like I had the marketing mindset. The bigger challenge was how do you, um, my, so where are my strengths? My strengths is marketing, setting up sort of a big picture vision and getting people on board with it. Where I was not as good was around finance and operations. And then um, while I think I have some people skills, I wasn't good at being, um, at firing people. And so, uh, my first firing, we talk about it, there's a chapter in the book, it was, as, it was as bad as scenarios you can envision. So we had a guy who, um, really nice guy, sales, he, was our, he really was kind of our only salesperson, so we had a lot invested in him. While he was working for us, his wife had an affair with a priest, got pregnant, <laughs> and um, so needless to say, he was a little distracted, right? Um, and yet... You know, where you, when you're one, when you come, you got one salesperson. Like you can't afford to have your salesperson, only one, distracted because <laughs> sales drives everything. And so we tried. I was trying to give him advice, or trying to, you know, both uh, give him advice, but also say, hey, you know, we gotta have sales. And um, the the uh, it went on way too long, um, but eventually we, you know fired him, and, and uh, I remember talking to my co-founder, Barry, like, we got to give him severance because he's going through such a bad time. Barry's like, we'll give him two months severance, but I said, well, can't we get more than that? And Barry says, well, if you want to pay out of your pocket, you can, but how can you, you know, we don't have any sales anyway, so how, what are we going to pay him with? Um, the, the weekend after I fired him, I fired him on a Friday. That Sunday, I was driving back from a, a getaway with my wife, got a call from his brother. The guy had had a heart attack. I mean, it was just painful. It was really difficult. And... Um, so I, I, I have gotten much better at firing people. And I, you know, I'm not something I'm proud of, but clear, fast action is much better than stringing it out. It's better for the person being fired. It's much better for the company. Um, that's just one example. But so I've evolved and it is a, you know, it's not often, entrepreneurs are rarely the same people who are good managing a company in a large corporation. So that takes a different mindset, right? When you're an entrepreneur, you get attention by shouting and being persistent in a big company, that doesn't necessarily work. So um, I've made a bit of a transition that way too. I'm still, we're still known as being, you know, um, I don't want to say irritants, but a little, you know, noisy uh, in a large corporation. And we need to be because, you know, we're less than half a percent of Coca-Cola sales. And so we have to ask, if we get 3% of someone's attention, that's, that's a win. <coughs> Any questions? Hmm. You know, um, we have to, um, we have to, everyone's on a journey. Some are, some are consciously on it and thinking about how do I get healthier? And if they, you know, we're, it, for, the, for some people, we're, we're a spot they hope to get to. Um, for others, they're already there and honesty just meets their needs. Um, we can't be everything to everybody. So our drinks, the sweetest drinks we have out there are sort of 50 calories per eight ounce serving. Um, and we can help hopefully create a product that is delicious and satisfying, but we're not going to meet, you know, someone who likes Snapple or a sweet 100 calorie drink, we don't have an option for them. And that's the point. 
You know, they, they have a lot of choices. And it's interesting when we go to these restaurant chains because we go to some, you know, they really like our product. They, yeah, but we, we need to have a sweet tea and it needs to be 120 calories. I said, well, you, you can't have our, then you don't want our product. And that's really hard for me to say because we want that business. But we've got to sort of stand for something. And um, ideally, we know in the long term where consumers are headed. Not all consumers, but if this country is going to get healthier, they're headed toward where we are. And so um, we have to sort of continue to be where we are. And then we have to find messaging and packaging and um, advertising that makes them want to try us and hopefully stay with us. So that's our challenge. Well, one last question. You know, um, we ha I, I don't know that we have. Um, it's really interesting. Honest Kids is such a funny product because we haven't done any marketing for it. We go out and we give samples at events, but there's very little marketing that we do, partially because the Coca-Cola company has very strict rules about marketing to kids, so we're not going to go advertise on Sesame Street or something like that. Um, parents, like I say, I, uh, consumers, um, I give them a lot of credit. They, they have found the product. They tell their friends. Our best marketing is when you go to a soccer game or a birthday party and other parents are serving it to, the, to their, you know, to parents serve it to other kids. So um, we, it's still, that said, it's still small. There's certain channels where it does really well. We sell it in Target and it's, although Honest Kids in general is only 1% of the market, of, in, of, Honest, of the kids drink pouch market, at Target it's 13%. So we've got some retailers that get it and like it and like the positioning, being able to offer that premium, natural, healthy product. So um, those are some of the ways. But there's still a lot of uh, marketing we haven't figured out. The other funny thing about Honest Kids is, is um, if, you do a if you do some uh, focus groups, if you test this with kids, uh, if you ask a kid which product they like, do you like Honest Kids or, you know, at 40 calories or do you like a sweet drink at 100 calories? Well, of course the kid's going to say they like 100 calories. That's what kids are designed to do. That's their, that's their job. <laughs> but if you go to a lunchbox and a, and a kid is um, eating lunch and, and that's the only thing in their lunchbox, guess what they're going to drink? And his kids. And on Monday they may say, oh, I don't know, this doesn't taste the way I'm used to. But they'll drink it. Tuesday they'll, they'll drink it with a little shrug. By Friday, that's what they're drinking and they're used to it. So you can really um, change the palate. Uh, and we've done the test. We know 40 calories is just about right. You can't, at 30 calories, the kids are like, ah, I'll just get some water. You know, they'll, they'll tell their parents to change. So it really is sort of this kind of, it's a, it's our, we call it our tad sweet spot, just a tad sweet spot um, where it works. So, um, well, let me just say in closing, I'll, I will, um, I know I've been a little preachy here. I, I want to um, close maybe a little more upbeat just to say that um, the big surprise for me about building Honest Tea and about business in general is, is how much fun it can be. Um, it was a, um, I, I actually had come up, I worked in Washington before I went to business school, I worked on Capitol Hill, and I thought I wanted to be in politics. I thought that was sort of my path to make change happen. And um, I have to say that this has been, um, first of all, a lot more productive <laughs> than when I see what's going on in politics. You know, we, we create something every day. Um, but it also is, um, it's self-sufficient, um, self-propelling in a different way. So when I ran nonprofits, we'd go back every year and we'd have to um, raise money from funders, which is the normal cycle. Um, and that was how we sort of survived. And, and at Honest Tea, we go out and raise money every day. Our funders are our consumers. And when the consumers say, hey, we like this, then we get that opportunity to keep selling. And it doesn't always work, as I told you, we had some bombs. And they say, well, if we keep doing that, we're not going to stay in business. And, and of course, you know, it's wonderful that Coca-Cola um, has been supportive of, of the brand and of me. But that, too, is, is because the business works. And if the business doesn't work, you know, there's no guarantees. My, I don't have a, a permanent employment agreement. If, it, if the brand doesn't work, it doesn't work. And I'm, I don't have that role. And that's actually always been the case. Right? I did start the brand, but... You know, 10 years ago, uh, eight years ago, when we were running Honest Tea, if the business didn't work, hey, <laughs> it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You, you know, it's not, it doesn't, you don't have the opportunity to, to run a business perpetually. So you always have to make sure you're connected to the consumer 
Um, but more importantly, for me at least, you need to be connected to your passion. You need to find a way to take what you care about in the world and make it into something that can exist every day. Thanks again. I'm happy to stay here and sign books or uh, just talk to you. Thank you.